Hi, Budi. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Tashin. Uh, I am so happy to be with you and I've uh, been really looking forward to this for some time. And I was just telling someone that uh, I was going to be having you on the podcast. And I was like, you know, I have a little bit of a crush on Booty. And they were <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure everyone has a crush on Booty. And uh, I think this is this is true. As far as I can uh, tell, everyone <laughs> on the timeline has a crush on you. So, uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would love to hear maybe just to start uh, on that note, like you, I feel like that's, you have such an alive and special Twitter account that's, you know, has a really um, warm place in my heart. I love seeing your tweets and interacting with you and uh, playing alongside you. And I would love to hear just like what your experience of Twitter has been and, and you know, what that's like for you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for the high compliment. Um, uh, that's yeah, wow, how flat, how flattering. But I mean, I know you really mean it and I feel that energy interacting with you too. Um, my experience of Twitter has been great. Um, and it's kind of coming up on like a year of me using it a lot or and like falling into the basin of teapot. Um, I was calling it this like this basin of Twitter for a while, but I feel like teapot's really stuck. Um, this part of Twitter. And so, yeah, it might've been even like a year ago that I was talking to Hap and um, to Secrets to, uh, to Alamo, like um, in his other incarnation about how, um, how much Twitter felt like a like balm and like a, like, almost like a cuddle puddle. Like it felt very much like being at Burning Man to me, which we were, were all burners and we're all kind of comparing. And I have never had that experience of social media, I would say on other platforms and until about a year ago on Twitter, I felt like I've had a thing called so like, that I call social media anxiety. Like I am more generally more comfortable like in meat space and kind of freeze up and don't know how to be myself on social media. So Twitter has helped change that, which has been really important and is, um, also filtered back like into my life and helped me to notice places where I might like, if I want to, where I could choose to be more forthcoming or more open or less guarded. I mean, boundaries have their place too. But no, so my experience of, of Twitter has been great. And I really think it was immunitized by the, the pandemic. I, um, maybe only within the past few months, I've been able to look back and notice how much I was craving being with people in a kind of like vulnerable, intimate, playful way. And that's why I would, that's to go back to what I said about it being like being at Burning Man or being a, in a cuddle puddle. That's my experience of those things, right? Is like, sort of like, yeah, intimate and playful and like sensual and flirtatious, but still very kind of like, playfully discourse driven mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah you really do embody all those qualities and that's that's what I think everybody loves about your account and playing alongside <laughs> you so uh yeah what <clears throat> what like makes for a really good like big booty post or interaction like if like oh yeah that was a great shit post that I made there like that was that was really fun like what makes well, it really good for you Sometimes they're so surprising, right? Like the ones that, like stuff I have sitting as drafts or in my notes, like stuff I'm really pouring my heart into and working on really hard. Um, sometimes those get like like ten likes, right? And I'm like, oh, like come on. And uh, who knows? There's something about sometimes like spontaneity or saying things with less planning in my experience I don't think there's anything wrong with planning but this is what I have noticed is yeah uh, like a a shit post that kind of comes from the heart or that I kind of just am like just kind of put it out there without thinking so hard often those tend to do better and they surprise me so like the element of surprise or like I just described sort of what I could call an element of disappointment about the posts that don't do so well especially if they're ones that I'm really like geeking out about on myself but um 
the element of surprise is really lovely. Like, well, like just put something out there and just was kind of an afterthought. Maybe I'll even forget what I said and then later check and be like, oh, everyone's going crazy on this. Okay. So like what, yeah, so what? The element of spontaneity, I feel like, uh, I feel like that energy is out there and people maybe can feel that or, or something. And um, maybe it's also like, yeah, like, like what are the other ingredients? Well, maybe, yeah, like I enjoy a good post when I feel like I'm hosting. Um, even if it's something that I just sort of said flippantly and then people for whatever reason are glomming onto it and responding and like riffing. Yeah, it feels like a good party. Like it feels really generative and spontaneous and kind of, um, I like it best when it feels like there's like a lot of energy and it feels like for a moment in like the sort of Twitter sphere that tweet I can see it happening to other people's tweets too when a lot of like uh teapot sort of suddenly like piles on and wants to get in the conversation like it feels like it's an attractor for a moment and everyone's kind of like whoosh, like there and it's in real time so so yeah so I feel like it's it's also super fun when it's synchronous uh mm -hmm. and and uh like a huge like kind of wild silly group chat uh, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> you definitely bring those flavors for sure. And uh, <laughs> I love that explanation. Um, I feel like they're also, um, <clears throat> I don't know, the things that I tend to see in your posts are like, uh, they're very embodied and like often they're like flirty or like sexual or like just like playful. And then they're also just like, whip smart like i'm like you you make references to things I'm like i need to look that up and figure that out and i like you know i love that awesome. so it's, it's like such a cool blend of like um like physical embodiment like emotional connection and like really interesting ideas and uh of course like grounding and you know a lot of allusions to spiritual practice and things like that and like uh really like good insights there and i just love that that mix of things so uh, yeah Thanks. Those are like all my favorite things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and it's that that's like what you just said really encapsulates how um, <clears throat> it's been really integrative for me. Something about the the like short, like microblogging or like the short form, um, short format is has been really important as I can tend to get long winded or carried away or maybe detailed in a way that's pleasurable for me, but doesn't always grab people. And so kind of what what you just said uh it's been a good it's almost like a good practice for me to be able to uh be brief totally totally yeah totally. and yeah. to still manage to like put all that stuff in there and like i'm always i'm always a am i all yeah i mean am i always attempting multivalent meaning or like polysemousness. Yeah, I love that. But the, the, also the generative thing about Twitter is I find that stuff just arises like in the interactions among us all. Like even if I didn't intend another meaning or multiple meanings, they sort of like just bubble up or they're there to be noticed. Like they're making themselves through mm -hmm. the interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like see, and, and, and then I think as well for me, like seeing how other people shows up, it's like gives you something to riff with or play with and like, yeah, yeah. bounce off of and so on. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Like I know, I know myself in general, not just on Twitter, like as a person who kind of needs that, like even before we started recording, right, mm -hmm. I asked you to define a, a, a question that maybe a lot of people wouldn't need to find, or I don't know if a lot of people, but yeah, it helps. I've noticed that about myself. It really helps to have something to like lean against or push against or kind of like uh, like a like a jumping off point of of relationship with someone else is something I very much need. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to ask you that question and, and just hear uh, from you about your own life story and, uh, you know, how you got here today and where you've been and what you've been up to with your life. Yeah, so um, 
So I was born in Georgia and lived, and this may or may not end up being, I'm gonna work with a somewhat linear time format, but it, I'll probably also loop around. Um, uh, so, I was, so I was born in Georgia and spent like my first 18 years of life there. And, um, And then I moved, I kind of knew, I, I moved to New York for college and uh, like knew that college was kind of my ticket out of where I was from. Um, and so I, and, and I went to like a, a small liberal arts college upstate New York and um, also knew that after that, I would wanna move to New York City. Like I sort of had, I can look back and say, uh, I had sort of a plan. And then I spent uh, like, I spent about 13 years in New York before coming to California. So I've been in California for like, it, almost exactly five years now. And so um, that's sort of the, there. that's the geography of my life story. <laughs> um, so I'm probably now I'm noticing I'll probably go back and like layer layer things on. And so yeah, I mean sometimes I don't I never know what to say about my story. <laughs> so then like what like like what was I like? Like as a kid, I was like, like I can look back through my life and see how um much I have been myself the whole time. Does that make sense? Like as a little kid, I recall, I loved to play dress up and I still love to play dress up <laughs> like, and love to sort of like, like as kids do love to role play. Whereas in an adult, then that's like more considered a sort of thing not everyone does. I would argue that we all do, we just may or not may not be aware of it, right? And so, um, so yeah, I was like, and, and I would like do, I had a tree house. I would do like alchemy in the tree house. I had, I would, we'd have fires in the backyard and like I would take the charcoal from the fire and make up runes and draw them all over the tree house and like sort of hang just weird, you know, shit that I found like sticks or like a wooden spoon with a hole in the middle. I really liked, I would like hang them like totems off of the tree house. My house still kind of looks like that. Like this room is really pristine and clean because it's like where I do a lot of teaching. So I, it's for optics, but the rest is really maximalist. I would like powder rocks that had mica in them and mix them in old milk jugs with like these berries I would find in powder and like or, or like pummel like so I was kind of like I, that's the same person I am now I don't know so like as a little kid I feel like I was kind of like witchy and imaginative and sort of fancied myself a sorceress like I tweeted about this once but this feels very this image feels very dear to me I do this like picture of myself as a kid wearing this red cape that I used to like to wear to dress up in. And I had this white rabbit foot and this red rabbit foot, which I still have in my little like, like sort of special altar place that I would like wear as necklaces and sort of like run around the backyard pretending I was a sorceress. And so not much has changed. Um, and then I was kind of like, like a super student and kind of overachiever in school for a long time. I did, did something called International Baccalaureate and like, and I was dancing a lot. I danced for like five hours a week too. So I was kind of a chronic overachiever and chronically underslept and, but kind of really hungry to learn and like move. Um, and I was also really, but mostly ident identified as a visual artist. Um, Cap, my partner, my husband and I were talking about this the other day. We were just having a long drive and like talking about our histories. And I was remembering kind of all of this about 
myself, which isn't so different now, except that I, at that time, I like struggled to feel integrated about all of my disparate interests. And I think partly at that in general, and at that age, when you're in, in high school and maybe heading to college, I think there's a, I mean, not everybody is doing that, but whether you're headed to college or a trade or whatever, there's this push in the culture to like define yourself and to narrow it down and specialize already. And I ended up choosing where I went to college because I didn't have to pick a major. And like, I feel like my life now is funneling into me, a, me into a kind of dharmic path that I think we'll end up talking about later where I'm like choosing it as I go, but like to sort of, but be, I'm choosing it because I'm doing it. So like back then choosing it felt so artificial and I'm grateful to look back and know that I somehow knew that even if I got a lot of pushback, it, you know, there, I, I felt like I sometimes, I both felt really rooted in this knowledge that I didn't need to or shouldn't pick and also felt dysfunctional or a little broken in it sometimes too. Um, so, uh, and so then I went to college. So I had been like a dancer and kind of like always kind of academic. And then even though I didn't want to pick, they start making me pick. And so I did, I focused more on visual arts and sort of like visual culture in college. And I kind of dabbled all around. I did some animation and experimental filmmaking. If I had all the time in the world, I would still do it. Uh, I, but I did, I did a lot of painting and like, like oil painting and gouache to, for a little while I thought I wanted to be an, an Africanist. Like I was very into African artifacts and architecture. Um, and kind of, yeah, so I kind of went all around and that's, so I started getting into yoga around that time, actually. Actually in high school, I started doing yoga. And I, and I don't know why. Maybe, maybe we'll come back to it. This is where I start getting secure, circuitous and worrying I'm saying too much. No, not at all. I'm listening to you. <laughs> thanks, thanks for checking me. Sometimes I just need that assurance. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so like, so I remember having this feeling in college too, like I, um, of being like, so I had interest in, I had been doing for yoga for a few years. I had a developing interest in sort of different occult systems in college and had a lot of friends who were doing um, ceremonial magic or, or chaos magic or like, and, and I still had such diverse interests and I was like, I want to move, but I want to make visual art, but I'm re really interested in ideas. And I just didn't know, I was still feeling this kind of outside pressure to pick or, or choose or narrow myself down and didn't know how to, and that still felt like a problem. And so, um, I'm, uh, and so, yeah, I'm just going to be. I'm just gonna say it. I had my so I had my first then psychedelic experience on um, in college on DXM, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. So it's an dextromethorphan. I may be saying it wrong, but um, and so it's a really like that's sort of a phys physically hard thing, and I wouldn't recommend. It. I think it has a high body load, and that's not my choice. But I had a really good. I mean, that wouldn't be my choice anymore. But I sort of did that and I had this experience, I had a lot of experiences, like like I sort of died, but my sh sort of shadow or spirit was still connected to my pineal gland. And I like, a lot of things went on, <laughs> but I was able to it, in it somehow make like a correspondence chart of all the interests in my interests in my life and then see how flat and boring that was. and like how wrong a sort of this is this and that is that like a cult correspondence chart is. And somehow that like was incredibly integrating and like knitted together for me that I could just do all the stuff I wanted to do and it didn't matter or it mm. did matter, but it didn't, I didn't have to pick or choose. Somehow it set me at ease about um, needing to purposefully integrate everything and, and let me like, it, somehow it let me know in a really deep way that 
like stuff be integrating like like yeah does that make sense Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah and so then so then I graduated college and I moved to New York with like 400 bucks and no job and that was really difficult and scary for a while actually and kind of lonely uh I did it like and then like that during that time I was like yeah like painting like five nights ish a week like I was really invested in visual art for a while and then that's when I started really doing so I had done yoga in high school and college but then I really started doing yoga like what do I mean by that meaning I committed to a more regular practice and learned how to breathe in it so I went I was living in the Lower East Side and I went to um uh yoga to the people at the time which was donation based and um so the fact that it was a donation basement, I could afford to go to go a lot. And I like went, uh, was going four or five times a week. And that's when I think I've tweeted about, I've tweeted about a little bit of what I'm about to say, but there was a, like the music was horrible at yoga to the people, like just, just dreadful. Like, I don't know, you know, no offense to anyone who likes this, but it's just like Dave Matthews band and like John Mayer, the good music that people were playing. And somehow it was like all the teachers use the same playlist, like what? But somehow like, like the good music was, I think they would play like Enigma or Enya once in a while, which growing up, I kind of loved, loved Enigma and Enya. I don't know. Uh, anyway, the music was horrible and I learned how to breathe because I had to focus on my breath to not be, I mean, and I was an angrier person than to not be angry at the music because it was just so dreadful. <laughs> and it really like, like I'm so grateful that for that when I look back, like I really learned how to do like ujjayi breath in a, and be focused on it somewhat consistently for the first time in my yoga practice. And so I had this experience around that time of walking by walking like through Astor Place by the big like the black cube um, where the sort of like like goth kids hang out where I'm like, if I grew up in New York, I would probably want to be cool enough to hang around the cube and be disaffected. But um, and I just suddenly had this experience of like of like expansion of being bigger and more flexible and more mutable than I'd ever taught, been taught I had been. So it was kind of like, a, I would say in the story I'm telling now, like a further integration of what I realized during that psychedelic journey in, in college. Like it really felt spontaneous and like I, I suddenly in a way had to worry about less because I was like bigger and I, and again, more expansive and more flexible. Like there was really a big message in that about neuroplasticity for me too. And about getting, getting to choose how I wanted to be in the world, which I did not, while I had a pretty generally pretty great experience growing up and feel very lucky for it. I still feel like there was a lot of sort of, in my upbringing, a lot of like Eastern European sort of like immigrant grin and bear it, work hard, pu- like puritanical. There's a lot of that in my upbringing, though I also feel like I had a lot of support. I still was very much kind of like black sheep in my family. And so so I'm lucky to say I mostly have always felt supported in that. And yet I still feel like there were a lot of things taught. I wasn't taught about um, change, like volitional change in neuroplasticity and wholeness um, that I realized in that moment. So then what did I do? Then I, I wasn't on, I'd like been working restaurant jobs and things in New York and that for a while. And because of my interest in visual art, I always thought I was gonna be in the art world and I became an art handler or like a preparator for a little while, which I loved. It's very, you kind of have to think and do a little bit of basic math to hang things like like an art handler sort of like 
ride in a truck and go all around the city and move art between like galleries and artists studios and 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 offices and museums and things and then sometimes like hang up things or install them and so um and I just love that it was like a great way to know the city it was kind of like a perfect meeting of kind of like like blue collar and white collar in a way where you have to have certain expertise about knowledge but it's also really just like physical work with one's body found it very satisfying and then in that same company I was a, a truck dispatcher for a while just kind of like a beautiful fun ballet um like I kind of loved the logistics of that uh and then I um and but so I loved doing it. It was also a really dysfunctional company, and everyone was a workaholic, and like it's kind of falling apart all the time. And I, my yoga practice suffered, and I resented it. And it, and I started to really hate that job for a lot of reasons. And it drove me to do my first yoga training, which would have been like 2000. I think I started in 2008 or two, 2008 or nine, 2009. I think I started, and so. Um, and did my first training and I had this this like realization with a client on the phone that even though like so I wasn't in the art world as a in working for a gallery or really working on the commercial side it's all the commercial side but I the art world is just generally kind of a snake pit and it felt less and less aligned with my values and um and I felt like I was I had to say yes to people on the phone all day that should have this should be told no to make the world a better place but it was my job to like soothe and placate them. And I had this um, <clears throat> realization with one client who was like freaking out about getting some art hung. And I was like, oh, why, how can you not, you don't own a screwdriver? How can, I know it's like, a, I like have a whole job because people can't hang their own art, but like, oh my God, just hang your own art. And it was like soothing this woman. She really, she wanted to like change this art out that was on her wall for a, a dinner party and our truck was like late stuck in Friday New York traffic and Friday night traffic and like so I was like sort of soothing her and she was kind of crying and was like oh I just she's like I you just thank you like you have such a soothing voice I just love talking to you you really make me feel so good when I talk to you and I was like oh I was like that's because I'm gonna be a yoga teacher bitch like this is not what I'm supposed to be doing anyway and then the company kind of fell apart and I started teaching. I mean, there's a little more overlap, but um, yeah. <clears throat> and I taught, I've taught a ton of yoga <laughs> since then. And uh, maybe we'll talk about this more later, but concurrent with my yoga journey, I started getting into somatics. Maybe that's something we kind of bookmark to come, come back to. Oh, I love hearing all that and uh, yeah, it's really nice to fill out sort of your your life story and give, you know, we were talking earlier about <clears throat> how the uh, short form of Twitter is like really helpful and then it's also, I also just love the sort of privilege really of hearing people and their lives and it adds a lot of color and flavor to the context of what people choose to put into that short form and uh, it's really delightful to hear about all that and um, yeah, maybe we could zoom in to just hearing more about your yoga practice and your yoga teaching. Like, uh, you know, I've done a little bit of yoga myself, but it's not the tradition I'm most familiar with. And I would love to hear from you, like what styles you trained in and, and what you teach now and how you like to teach now based on your own practices. Yeah. Um, so I, like when I started in, in high school, I, um, I don't know where I don't know where, I mean, that would have been like 2000-ish. So yoga was becoming really popular. Um, and uh, I don't know where the interest came from though. That still remains this kind of interesting mystery to me. Um, and, but somehow I just wanted to learn yoga. And I had a friend in high school whose dad owned a yoga studio kind of near where I grew up. It did not occur to me to go to the yoga studio and take a class. Like, 
uh, and I still kind of puzzle over that, but I asked this friend to borrow some resources and he gave me um, uh, BKS Iyengar's Light on Yoga and um, uh, um, uh, Richard Freeman's Ashtanga primary series on video. And so I was doing both and like those who know will know that those systems, while of course like the poses, there's a lot in common with the poses and they're both from, we, both of the, um, both of those lineages have sort of the same, come from the same teacher or teacher's teacher. Um, they're also really different, but somehow, and I remember I ha had a little cognitive dissonance on being like, well, this, I do this video and they say to do the pose this way, but then I'm reading this book and it says to do the pose this way. But so I, st I started out with those two sort of systems and then, this may not be true for everyone of that age, but being kind of a fiery, passionate, young, like late teenager, Ashtanga really stuck. So Ashtanga is much more sort of fast moving and like acrobatic and challenging. Well, so is Iyengar, but, um, but I think Ashtanga can tend to appeal to certain kind of fire, fiery, fast moving, like, type A folks. And I was much more like that than um, I would not describe myself that way now. So, so I started doing those and kind of then I did a little Kundalini in college um, and continued to dabble and then got more into vinyasa, which vinyasa takes a lot from Iyengar and from Ashtanga. Um, and so, but for a long time, like sort of vinyasa and like alignment based vinyasa which would be kind of a fusion of Iyengar and um and ashtanga was sort of my practice which i would say is different than like power yoga or other things like even sort of newer or more recent types um i guess those were being developed then but so i started uh, uh kind of in those worlds and settled into being an Ashtangi and was like assisting in Ashtanga for a while. Um, and, but you know, for me, I noticed that Ashtanga really wound me up in this way. And, and I think also I tend to be over flexible in certain places um, and have some connective tissue injuries. And I know I started like I, I, there's a, a tendency to vilify certain yoga lineages that I hear, like blaming the Ashtanga for injury. And it's a me enmeshed in an overall culture of overachievement. That's part of the problem of Ashtanga, but it's part of the cultural problem too, because I was doing that as a student, I don't know. So I'm just sort of pushing back as I say this, like against the sort of like, I don't know, Ashtanga bad. It was really formative for me. And I still do the primary series sometimes, just super slow. I'm part of why I ended up like quitting Ashtanga too, was that to do it at the pace I wanted. At a certain point, my practice was like two and a half hours or three hours long of asana. Yay, great. But I have so many interests that just didn't feel like what I needed. Um, and so, so I started gravitating towards um, Iyengar because it made me feel like, so Iyengar is still super, I'd say both are kind of forceful in the like Hatha definition of, of like, like yoga meaning kind of forceful or Hatha can even mean like violent. Though Hatha has uh, the folk translation of meaning like sun, moon or something about balancing the opposites as well. Um, and, and I'll say, uh, Iyengar just, sort of, which I was also like the, the yoga school I ended up choosing to study at, jokingly called itself the Harvard of yoga, which is definitely why I, I chose it, but had a really strong Iyengar component and a really strong Ashtanga component. Though to really teach in those lineages, um, in both you, generally have to go study with the family in India. They're like, I would say they're some of the more, they have more sort of quality control in their dissemination, frankly, than like uh, 
most vinyasa. And so, um, so I never studied them quite that seriously, but I got kind of serious about Iyengar when I was training it, doing my yoga training because it made me feel so good and so like down regulated. Um, and I also will say now like that a lot of the soft tissue injuries I've had, I've learned to heal and take care of through the kind of active or facilitated stretching that um, Iyengar, that is a big part of Iyengar practice. So, but my, so my training had these other, these like, um, was fairly well-rounded in that. And I feel grateful I got to learn sort of a few of these like big name schools of yoga. Um, and my training was also in a kind of yoga therapy. So I'm not a yoga therapist, um, though I will be a movement therapist or somatic movement therapist someday. Though the word therapy used in that way is fairly, um, I think as it should be fairly gate kept and like declaring oneself a therapist. Um, so I, uh, the, the part of the training that started to, that surprised me, the part that I did not, so I signed up for the training I did because there was a big like philosophical component and then a lot of a young, uh, I, I Yengar and Ashtanga, but really what then started uh, the sort of like subtext of the training or what they sort of snuck in and not in a bad way was, um, uh, like what ha has been called desikachar style or has been called vini yoga, although those are maybe not the preferred names for a variety of reasons. I feel like that school, there's sort of, there was a sex scandal and that school is sort of fragmented. And um, so I almost don't know what to call it, but my teacher ten now calls it like Krishnamacharya yoga. And so, and so that's sort of the through line is that like, um, uh, Tarumalai Krishnamacharya, I would say is sort of the grandfather of my lineage and at different times in his life, he taught different styles. Like he taught, um, and in different contexts, he taught Iyengar, what he taught Iyengar because Iyengar was, I think in Iyengar's like, um, self-description kind of a sickly kid. And so he used a lot of props and a lot of support and worked more slowly. Um, he was teaching 15 year old boys at the um, <clears throat> palace in Mysore and developed Ashtanga with all of its sort of quick intensity. And like, even they're like in it, there are other things like Drishti, like each pose has a place you focus sort of anywhere your attention can wander is accounted for because of the context in which he was teaching. And so the sort of the therapeutic part is a lot of what um, Krishnamacharya was landing on sort of later in life, which tend to be more simpler, more breath-based um, in a way, um, yeah, I'll just say more therapeutic and more even kind of repetitive to allow for, um, like the primacy of the breath. And, and so this style, like this style was um, taught by his son, by uh, Krishna Namacharya's son, Desikachar, who most of my teachers, even in somatics and anatomy are um, Desikachar students. So I never studied with Desikachar directly, but I can kind of like step back and be like, whether I was trying to or not, I ended up uh, with that sort of being my core lineage. And I don't, I wouldn't say I teach faithfully to that, but there, uh, but it, it still informs everything that I teach. And again, it, yeah, so formally it's, a, I've diverged, but um, like core principles of attunement to the individual, like not fitting the individual into the practice, but fitting the practice to the individual, um, the primacy of the breath and, and a sort of emphasis on like uh, down regulation is what I've taken from that. And again, I think the fact that my somatics mentor is also um, like 
she probably wouldn't call herself a student in the Desica Char lineage, but that is still clearly very informed by, by the principles I just described, um, feels very um, integrative. There's something else I was gonna say. Um, and there's also this, so there's this simplicity, but also clarity. Desica Char was uh, a, an engineer. So there's also this very, um, Uh, diagrammatic is not exactly the right word, but very, um, a kind of clear getting from A to B um, that is a part of, well, I'll say, my lineage. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's great to hear about the background there. And um, <clears throat> it seems like there's also a few influences outside of yoga that you have on your practice and your teaching and you mentioned somatics and I know there's something called body mind centering as well that uh, has been an influence on you and I would love to hear about uh, the kind of other influences on your own practice and teaching outside of outside of yoga and and how those relate to the the yoga that you teach yeah um so my biggest influence now is probably um is body mind centering, which mm -hmm. is a somatic approach um, to movement that I've been studying seriously for, I guess, about three or four years, though um, semi seriously for six or seven. And, and I can look back and see that in my first yoga training, which was about 12, 13 years ago, my anatomy teachers in that training and in my 500 hour training were both. Um, uh, BMC people. And so I, um, went in kind of knowing I was already interested in the anatomy. Like that's always been, uh, <clears throat> anatomy can seem heady for some people and can take some people out of it. But for me, that really gives me something to kind of hold on to, to get me right in my body. Like I'm very, like I never, for, for me, that just worked to be like, okay, I'm curious about this structure. I'm going to like go and I'm see what it, looks like so I can visualize it and then beyond visualizing it what is it what does it feel like when I just get in there and like try to feel whatever that structure is which is very much what BMC is so early on that seed was kind of planted um and then when I looked for sort of um uh, like further anatomy study after my first two yoga trainings I uh landed upon i'm trying not to drop too many names i mean my face is here but i'm trying to not let it be too doxy mm, i see <laughs> but i guess i could say i mean uh, i'll at least yeah so i ended up um studying at the the breathing project in new york for a while uh i'll drop that name which is very much a like somatic and particularly bmc informed approach to anatomy and also so the two teachers that like led that um, center. It's now the Babies Project and um, very much focused on like a BMC approach to developmental movement and working like with babies. Um, but the two, the folks that were heading up that organization were both like Desica Char people and, um, and body mind centering people. So that kind of fusion is, and when I kind of step back and look, I realize that's really what what I'm doing. And so, so yeah, I mean, uh, body mind centering um, is I so I about two three times a year. I now that the pandemic is in a new phase, and before the pandemic, I I study it pretty intensely. There are these different modules we do. And so eventually I'll be something called a somatic movement educator and eventually like a somatic movement therapist or practitioner. Um, and um, uh, its approach is very much what I just described about like using science and anatomy and, and a lot of even using a lot of like kind of cutting edge like my teacher uses a ton of systems theory um, and sort of like bleeding edge science um, that um, 
as an inroad to then uh, like being in our bodies and, and in relationship with one another and seeing what arises. So I, I was there, I was training, uh, I don't even know what, what date it is, but like, I guess it was only a month ago. It feels like eons ago, but I was just on the East Coast in a training on the nervous system for it. And one of my teachers said like, oh, like BMC is just an excuse to get together, which is really all anything is. But I, I realize in that community that that is um, so beautifully upheld. And in uh, and the communities I gravitate toward of which toward of which BMC is one are the ones where it feels like folks are really just interested in being with one another um, and exploring being together. And that's very much what it feels like at its at its heart is like, we work with a lot of touch or like movement uh, and and like what would it be if I like like touched your arm or, or you touched my arm and oh maybe I'm breaking up a little. Mm -hmm. um, what would it be though if I like like from the sort of I don't even want to say artifice but just for me the fun idea that I could like touch your arm and like be in the fatty sort of like sensual mind of my like, I don't know if my myelin, like cushiony and sort of slippery, what would it be like if I were like that and like touching you and could you feel it too? And not like I'm putting it in you, but like, cause the interesting thing is the dialoguing in it and, and like important, like what's been ended up being important sort of psychosomatic boundary work for me and being like oh I actually don't feel what you're feeling at all or being like I think I can tune into that or being like I feel something sort of like a oh, like a fleeting little spark that I can't even follow it's so quick and like I think that's like I think those are my nerve impulses I don't know so it's more about like getting together and sort of feeling and moving and it's incredibly like psychedelic and intimate and like it really feels like a space where we get to be intimate together and some of the folks I'm studying with I've known for a long time and are like will probably be lifelong best friends and then others I'm like wow we just met but we're like there's such great unspoken intimacy um and so that is that not yoga mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful that really gave me a sense of what that practice is like for you. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of specifics to like what the techniques are and things like that, but like really got a sense of what that's like for you and, and how that connects to <clears throat> the yoga practices that you do. And um, yeah, it's nice, nice to hear about that. I feel like uh, I'm getting the sense that, um, how to put it? Oh, I don't know, just that embodiment has been a primary um, path or method for you and and then the specific guises that that takes has changed from dance to yoga and body mind centering and other things but it's just like how do I how do I be in a body in a way that's delightful and and useful and connecting and so on yeah right like I have really realized like I can look back in my life and I just want to like explore like I'm certainly like a psychonaut but I'm like a psychosomonaut <laughs> um too and uh like yeah I really just want to sort of like like I, I just want to explore I don't know there's just so like sometimes being is wonderful and sometimes it's terrible but I really like want to just die dive into it all I just like I just love it and I want to explore it with the other people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like there's a recurring theme that I've seen from your tweets about this, about like, um, like using the word body mind or like different words like that and, and sort of maybe rejecting a duality between mind and body in favor of something more holistic and integrated. And uh, I wonder if that, if that's, that is a point you're trying to make and, and how you would, uh, how you would frame that? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, I am, and like, uh, yeah, I'm very much interested in um, investigating the like 
dualism that like that underpins at least Euro Western sort of thinking about our bodies. And it's uh, like, especially because I'm an anatomy student um, and love it at the same time, like anatomy as a field is predicated on like my mind body duality, but more like uh, mind, like our body spirit duality because of like both uh, Descartes being a horologist and be meaning like there was sort of a like zeitgeist at the time of like me like mechanization and like taking apart thing like taking things apart or breaking things into their constituent parts and putting them back together and knowing how they worked. So it was very much his approach to anatomy and it was also his like loophole for being able to dissect bodies and it not being um, heretical to the Catholic church. So, and I think it's it seems like foundational and somewhat unexamined in language too. And so I, I this is a, just an open question. Is duality like a problem with language? Is it, it's not specifically a Euro Western problem because it's like the Eastern like schools and texts and bodies of work that I'm interested in also are like, it seems evergreen, like sort of exploring what it means to be a body or be a mind or to be a body mind or a body mind world, which I might have to hat tip hat savage for body mind world I he might have come up with that though I don't know there are a lot of things we argue about who came up with them first um so <laughs> uh we're very much learning together um and but I I am yes I'm just consistent I'm just just always interested in like finding like like being able to discern between something that is body and something that is mind is helpful and we have to agree on language to even communicate but then like even body could mean so much more than this like it could mean i don't know my body could be in the room with you now um and is that my body is that my do i have to qualify it and say that's my extended body or is it my ethereal body or energetic body like so so <clears throat> I don't know. And like, or in his, so that's why I started saying body mind, because that sort of says that there's something more synergistic going on, but it's still limited. So yeah, I'm, it's all, I'm like always in the process of trying to find ways to express like a shifting loci of experience. Mm -hmm. You talked about how dualistic assumptions are present in anatomy and a lot of Western traditions broadly. And I wonder if you could speak to the other perspective of non-duality and what non-duality is and how you would frame that. Yeah, so uh, it's a fool's errand to even try to parse non-duality, right? And it's so mm. fun. <laughs> like I'll- I'm a fool, I, so maybe you can I'm join me in my foolishness. <laughs> Too, and I know exactly I can like full recognize fool or foolishness recognize <laughs> foolishness or, or something because I see you and um yeah I let's all just be fools together um <clears throat> so yeah I think that um it, whatever non-duality is certainly can't be expressed in words but gosh is it fun to like to try um <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I try to like when you know I try to like really stay open about it because it's definitely a thing I can like argue with people about and get heated about which is awfully silly but there you go like just noticing that um, about my Twitter experience sometimes or my life experience sometimes yeah so but it's really important um, I see non-duality and like oneness or monism getting conflated a lot um and um uh which is not detailed enough or not something enough like like i would say non-duality also contains oneness or monism 
but I'm often swinging the pendulum away from that because I, I seem to see discussions revolve around the flatness of being like, oh, well, yeah, we're all one. So, and which loses like the importance of dualistic impressions to get through like day to day life and it sounds badly boundaried and there's no fucking room for diversity or ecology if we're all one like yeah like so that's why i want to pick it apart and be like we're one system or one orgasm i almost said orgasm one organism or we're one orgasm maybe but we're also a chorus of it like it's actually really important that um there are different um that there is difference and that's like a i think a part of what i yeah, that's a part of non-duality too, is like connection, but not sameness. Um, and like, like the, the requisite, there is requisite variety for there to be life and for like for there to be something to push against. And so, so I like the definition of non-duality as like not one, not two. Um, and it being kind of an ecological, like interconnected, um, interpenetrating multiplicity, mm -hmm. but that I still may not always be able to see where one ends or one begins. And I, that, so sometimes that feel like, I feel like I use it sort of idiosyncratically in that respect. I don't know if that's true, but um, that is what, that's the ax I'm grinding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that would be, it's like something about feeling my individuality and yet at the same time feeling how shaped I am by everyone around me. I mean, it's, it, it is then like, non-duality is kind of like the fullness or like a full expression of emptiness or something. And that my, I am somehow me and I'm still somehow only ever who I am in relationship to everything else. And that's sort of where like, even what my body is breaks down. Like I'm starting to say like, is my body like my cognitive, my larger cognitive system. And then I'm also, I'm using the word cognitive idiosyncratically. Like I mean something much more bodied than one might mean, but how could it not be bodied? Like thinking is bodied. Um, and I'm doing it with you now and with like, everything around me mm, mm. as you talk about that i'm reminded of uh our earlier conversation about twitter and interacting on twitter and it's like well i could frame it as like booty has these amazing tweets that are really incredible and i love them a lot but like and that's true but also like the way you show up or the way anyone shows up there is like co-created and like interacted and it's not like um it's like a playful interaction and, and even like a tweet that you write is caused by you having interacted with the world and seen other people and so on and so even though you're like a locus for the arising of a particular tweet or thread or reply or something it's like something that we co-create together and uh i don't know I'm like even though it's of course, a, a deep spiritual teaching to talk about non-duality. It's like also a very, um, it seems to me the way you're talking about it, it's a very like grounded and everyday kind of experience that's, you know, would even show up on Twitter or something like that of like, which is where you and I connect, for example, it's like that it, it reflects in each aspect of life, it sounds like. Yeah, that's beautiful what you just said. And that's and a really important distinction that like a non-dual experiences are, are, are like just are banal. Like I, I think there's also this sort of, like it's a little bit like the fascination with enlightenment being this super special place that not a lot of people get to and that like it's one and done, it's static. Like this is how I hear it talked about anyway. And that non-dual experiences are like that too. And they're not just winking at us all the time if we know how to look or listen, or even if we're not, like sometimes if I'm in, like I'd say a really big place of suffering, I'm just like gonna get like, just like 
smacked upside the head by non-duality and be like, oh, be like, fuck, I didn't want to see that right now. Like, because it's like truthy and is going to pull me out of my suffering. Like, I don't know. It's a, uh, right. It's just sort of, it's just, I mean, it's, it sounds so silly to say it's everything, but yeah, it's sort of everything and everywhere, like little moments of enlightenment. And I think we, even if we can't say exactly what it is, we lose something more of just bodying what it is if we think it's like something sort of special or to be achieved. And it is special, but it's also just um, quotidian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and through, and I don't even know if I like the word realized and just it's, but, but it's something by just like, doing day-to-day things mm. or being day-to-day things mm. yeah I'm reminded of you talking about your experience at Astor Place and like it sounds like that was a like significant experience of this flavor and that it was like a, a momentous occasion for you but also uh nowadays it's like okay I'm dancing or I'm talking to Tasha or I'm tweeting or I'm you know gardening or something and it's like that those that flavor could be present in in anything it seems like yeah I love that as a flavor right that it's 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 I think it can be and the more I kind of explore it or look for it the more that I realize it's just kind of all like pervading how would you uh Yeah, like I'm kind of curious, like what, not that there's any answer to, I don't think you could answer this. Maybe you could, if you can feel free, but I'm I'm, like, it's like an open question for the world of like what occasioned a prominent experience like the one you had at Astor Place or um, what, what precedes something like that. And then similarly, like how you would sort of nudge someone towards that or like help them see it if they haven't seen it or (laughs) someone listening to this or this fool over here that you're talking to like what what is it that people are looking for you know yeah I mean it can help to like talk about it or tweet about it or like discourse about it in speech or language sometimes but not all the times and I find myself sometimes like I like it really is a practice for me to like sort of say what I want to say about it and then have to like let go at a certain point and be like I'm not necessarily going to convince this person this way and you know they're going to have to have whatever experience they're going to have and name it for themselves I do feel like my that is why I feel like I am doing my dharma as a yoga teacher and movement teacher because um it it feels like that's a way where I can less I can be didactic about certain things so I'm creating a clear container in a in a formal way and by form I mean like suggesting that people might do a certain shape with their bodies and kind of getting granular about the details of making that shape and I I that container and leaving enough space that um, my students and clients can have their own experiences. And um, the form is just a tool, kind of just like BMC is just a reason to get together. Like it's, instead of me being like, okay, like you're on your mat. I don't know, have have an experience. Like it's just somewhere to start. Like that's all any of it is. In a way it's all arbitrary. Um, but we agree upon a a language and then we play with it together and see what arises. And I feel very grateful that that's my job. Like, that's what I do. And I can say it to you now and be like, that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm here. And along the way, it was like occluded to me. Like I was sort of in, have been in my life groove and still was, um, like agnostic to it or ignorant to it. And maybe I still am, who knows, in like 20 years, I'll be like, oh, this is actually what I've been doing. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> though I feel a little bit more like sort of aware of what my path is and like what what I'm doing here now. So yeah, so I would say for me, it's more about like in a classroom setting, I feel like it's just, it's about the like co-arising of the teaching when we're being together, where I go in with a plan, but 
like I'm very much a meta teacher and that like I'm just there to say some stuff and create a form and and whatever I've planned is always changed by who's in the classroom and I'm a better teacher but by because of my students I mean I'm only a teacher because of my students like that's there's another example of non-duality or emptiness and the material that I teach feel, comes through me and is better than anything I could ever teach as an individual because I in that way I am kind of an individual and kind of me but I'm in relationship with my students so I'd say it's those like special moments in a classroom of being together and seeing what arises that is the only way that one could not even teach that but that we could experience that together mm. yeah a lot like of a teacher oh pardon like a, like a teacher brings I bring a certain expertise as a teacher and Let's see, oh, sorry, uh, <clears throat> span. But um, I bring a certain expertise as a teacher, but I'm not the expert on the uh, my students or clients experience. And so it's like finding an in intentional place of connection together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what were you gonna say? Just um, there's a recognition hearing what you're saying and it's like a sort of, seeing it in different places and uh, it's, it's nice to to recognize that flavor so um, yeah yeah i'm not even sure how to ask this question but like uh, the way that you show up on twitter and in our friendship and in life like i feel there's um a theme of you know you're talking about like uh, like in costumes and dress up earlier and like role playing. And then there's also like, uh, like dance or like going to Burning Man or like, you know, you talk really openly about sexuality and being an embodied sexual person. And like, I, I love that. It's really nourishing to see you uh, embody all of these things and represent them and like show your personality and show express yourself and like not hide aspects of yourself and um, I wonder if you could talk about that and like how you, how that fits into things of like showing your individuality and showing, you know, like your animality and like sexuality and like things like that, like ma manifesting those sort of like maybe like sensorious or personal aspects of self in the world. Yeah. Um... Can you re possibly rephrase the per first part of your question? I mean, um, yeah, maybe, maybe just to put it differently, like in a lot of the traditions that I've been exposed to, there are either explicit or implicit messages of like the body is shameful or personality is shameful and you should repress them. And like, that might not be, that might be intentional. It might be unintentional, but like often, that message is conveyed or that message is received, shall we say, I received that message. And, you know, that's been an unwinding process for me of like how to uh, not only accept, but embrace and express my own self and personality, including things that are like sexuality or just like playfulness or, uh, you know, um, expressiveness or things like that. And I would love to hear you speak to that of like, how you embody yourself in the world yeah yeah well yeah so like when i told my um <clears throat> sort of life story and mm -hmm. like talked about my childhood like i can see there's a kind of magical sensual sort of uh feralness to me that has always been there and i'm like grateful to look back and see it and yeah i feel like this world i don't know civilization i don't like a, a hugely sex negative culture like um and many sex negative cultures um seek to quash that and i say i feel like i'm unraveling it and even like how i am in life and like on twitter is still me like learning to unravel that um and um yeah i mean like i yeah it so I'm trying to figure out where to start 
because they're just the sex negativity is so pervasive or the anti sort of sexuality or sort of body denial and and is a big part of like western culture and especially the sort of like um like very like puritanical culture which I feel like was very much part of my upbringing was like I kind of said it earlier but it was kind of like grin and bear it work hard like um don't complain like and uh, where I learned a lot of body denial. I mean, and frankly, like let's like, just to be really legible for a second, like that's also just like, like a system, I'm just gonna say it, like a system based on like generating capital above all makes us deny our bodies. That is like what the system we're in is based on like period. Um, and so, so body denial is so pervasive, but it's everywhere. Like in my, um, there was a like, like Brahmin philosopher that did a lot of the um, philosophy for my yoga trainings. And he like, when we were studying the yoga sutra, he was like, you know, your body is a disgusting sack of fluids. That's why we're here doing mm. this. And and that was a seed kind of fairly early on in my training of me being like, whoa, like we're doing something different. Like that doesn't sound whole. Um, and so, so I'm not just like gonna come down on Western culture. I think this has been a big question, like all a human question. Um, and, uh, and I can certainly see how like, especially if we're looking at ascetic traditions, how like sex is so distracting um, and takes a lot of energy and like is like sort of the thing that like a, it's a huge attractor for where one's consciousness goes. I think that's great and I wanna explore it more. Um, and maybe like there are, are, maybe the sex negative strains are just even there so that I can like, be my sort of like rebellious left-hand path self that I can say I've always been like as a kid in a coin flip, I always picked tails. I've just always been like the being like, like have a little mischievous part that wants to like, like, I don't know, thwart or disrupt or like, like pick root for the underdog or, or something. I don't know what that is, but that's just always like been a part of me. And, um, it's really feel, it feels like a big part of my healing that I'm in in a, a place where I can be really open about it and playful about it and and really sexual. I think also Twitter has been healing for me because and and I think I am a burner for this reason too. Like Burning Man feels like a space that's very sexual, but is not as sex negative and like monogamist assuming as like the default world in that there's much more room for, for open-ended flirting and being sexual and like scantily clad without there necessarily being as much an, of an expectation about sex needing to happen. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but at all, but I will say also like, it's a tricky boundary balance to both to be sexually open in a way that feels good for me and I think is healing for the world and to also be careful out in the world where the principles at work are different such that I might uh, how to say it I don't know but like like I feel a certain responsibility like as like a woman and and even as an introvert and it's different things like out in the world where I feel like I'd like also have to, like I'm trying to avoid using words like self-protection here and other things like that because that would be another piece of this. And I'm, I'm not really speaking to even like the level of trauma but I'm speaking to just being like, like sort of what I'm gonna call tantric like open-ended like flirting as sort of a way of being that's beautiful and healthy doesn't always feel possible in the wider culture. Mm -hmm. And it feels like a responsibility to myself and others to not always go there, which is a fucking bummer. And so I feel like in like burner situations and, and Twitter, like too, I can just be a little more exploratory about that in a way that feels very natural to me. 
and that I feel like others are engaging with too. Maybe I'm projecting, but I feel a lot of that. Like there's a lot of just like very fun sort of like intellectual flirting as a vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely pick up on that in Twitter and that's been really healing for me. You know, I haven't been a burner, but I, you know, have been exposed to that culture through you and others and like feel that on Twitter and as a sort of safe place to express really not just sexuality in particular, but also I, I, I think this is coming to me is like, if you shut down an aspect of experience, especially one as primal as sexuality, but really any aspect of experience, like I don't know, anger, for example, or something like that, then uh, it, it seems to me you're like closing yourself off from full expressiveness in the world and also even like full service in the world. And uh, that is painful to do for self, but also like, you know, for me, it's certainly been painful when I've done that, but it's also like a missed opportunity to fully show up and be of service in the world. And um, it's about like expressiveness in general. And so it's not just like, I know that maybe I'm just telling myself this in the past, but it's not just about like, oh, like sexual freedom for the sake of sexual freedom or something like that. It's like, no, if you shut that down, like you're shutting your whole life down and don't, don't, don't shut down aspects of yourself or, or hide them, or at least like learn how to express them skillfully in safe places. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. And like, like to talk about the sort of materiality of our bodies for a sec, like, like, let's say in my like connective tissue web, like tension in one place can then like create sort of like tension in surprising other places. And, um, so I totally, I totally agree that like, we can't always like shutting anything down instead of looking at it and exploring it. And like, is, um, I was gonna use the word dangerous, but it just feels like the stuff will come out anyway. Like it's this sort of shadow like discourse, but like it'll come out in another surprising way. I don't wanna say that one has less control over. I don't really like that terminology, but um, <clears throat> if one isn't, doesn't bring it into consciousness, it's gonna be there anyway. And like uh, where, where one has less opportunity, like you say, of being of service around it because one's not looking at it directly. Yeah, for me, yeah. when that stuff has come up, it's always like, if it's repressed, then it's always comes out in like weird, unskillful, uh, for lack of a better term, like inappropriate ways, like not not fitting to the situation, you know? Uh, totally. Yeah, and um, that's always a sign of like, oh, there's something here to, to look at and integrate. And I think yeah, that also points out and something I really appreciate about having you on in particular, but certainly many people that I've had on the show or on Twitter or in my life is like fully expressing and embodying different aspects of self is itself a service in the world. Like you being you on Twitter has been a service to me in showing me like, this is what it's like to embody these different aspects. And like just being yourself is already a service to the world and is a benefit to other people. And I um, wanna, wanna thank you for that, for your example. And, and also just like highlight that as like, um, just like that, it, it's not obvious that that would be the case. Like just being yourself is a service, but I think it's so true that it is. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really lovely way of putting something extremely important, which is what I was getting at when I was trying to define non-duality. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I mean by like, mm. like diversity or ecology is, is that um, like eco ecological systems work because of diversity, because of the beautiful, unique individuality of all the participants. Mm. And so like, that's how systems work well. Um, there's not enough generative tension if there isn't uniqueness among the agents in a system. And um, yeah, I agree that just simply by being ourselves with awareness, we serve others. And I feel that from you and I feel that from you know my favorite people on Twitter. I feel like I have learned so much. And mm. it, I mean, from the people in my, life of in 
in general um, who are being most th themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that points out too, I think like if you are inspired by someone or, or moved by their example, like at least for me, there's been a tendency in the past to be like, oh, I have to become them or like be just like them. And it's like, no, no, that their example occasions something in you, moves something in you that has to come to life. But like what that will look like is is different. You know, like I, I'm not going to become like a yoga teacher, for example, just from having this conversation, even though I think that's that's amazing. But like the things that you light up for me are like moving within and then that, yeah, spreads out into different aspects of life and that will look different. Like I, I am a different person than you are, but I'm moved by your example and that that's similar in all the cases, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything uh, that's like kind of nearby, anything that we've talked about that you'd like to dive into more or talk more about? You know, we talked about talking about Tantra, mm -hmm. which makes me want to call Hap over. Mm, please. So I, I think I'm doing that. <laughs> okay, great. This is a nice uh, redux of our previous episode where I had Hap on and we had the privilege of having you join. So it's a nice symmetry there. Yeah, no, it's sort of a symmetry or a, a yin and yang or like mm -hmm. a, like interpenetration, right? Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's appropriate to Tantra, at least as a more like sort of specific um, uh, um, like, I guess we'll, we'll get into defining that. I'm kind of waiting to define that until he arrives. But if, if we take a sort of stricter, like, or historical definition, like, or, or talk about like tantric texts, they're often done as a dialogue between consorts. And so it also feels like, um, like meta to, and uh, just, um, self same or like uh, coherent to call mm. him in. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, and I think it kind of uh, like, um, it might help us continue to foolishly parse whatever non-duality is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll start to say that like Tantra is to me then in, a, in me using the word rather like loosely or sort of non-historically, um, then by Tantra, I might also mean something like the sort of like like creative fun playful state generated by like open-ended flirting that is goalless mm. and, and i can say like burning man has become such a part of my life because i feel that there and the other thing uh, bmc is a thing i study because i feel maybe there's more intimacy and a little less of the sort of per sexual arousal in particular but there's still a, like a, a, a sensual um, kind of tantra to it. Again, that's about like recognizing interrelationship mm -hmm. um, and the sort of create creative sparks that arise from relationship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. So, yeah. <laughs> I think it's nice. Uh like what I've been talking about with your impact on me is, is very much true for Hap as well. And like, uh, how to put it? Um, yeah, like you both have had similar effects on me, but like in your own ways and from who you are. And it's like almost, um, I mean, yeah, you two are partners and you're married and it's like you two have had very similar effects on me, but they're like, yeah, like isomorphic effects of like, Beautiful. they're like coming from booty and coming from hap, but like different to, and specific to who you are. And uh, yeah, it's beautiful oh, to have hap joining. Oh, that's so lovely. He's coming in now. And actually I realized though, I'm wearing these, I'm wearing mm. AirPods and that's always a probably it won't affect the sound quality too much but give me a second while i i remove them i feel like lately sure. they've been uh computer airpod mm -hmm. system needs a second no problem uh. 
yes or no? Yeah, now I can hear you. And, okay, good. Yeah, there's always like a little moment of that, right? Mm -hmm. so. Definitely. Hey, sweetie. Hey. Hey, Hap, welcome, friend. Hey, Tashin. It's been a minute. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I've just been praising you and praising Booty and expressing gratitude for the impact that both of you have had on me and grateful to have you join us. So, yeah. Yeah, back at you, back at you. Where are you in the world right now? Currently in Colorado. Yeah, I'll be here for another month or so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, what have you guys been, what, what did you figure out? What, what, what problems have you solved? I feel like we've only created more problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we are sort of getting at uh, what what tantra is, and and uh, and also talking earlier about what non duality is, and uh, thought that you might be able to shed some light by sharing with us in this conversation. Uh, you might be able to make a shadow by getting uh -huh. excellent. But I would say that our like a lot of what I understand, like when I use the word tantra, and I use it in a, to mean a lot of sort of a lot of different things. Um, I but most of what I embody in that meaning now, I know now in my life untheoretically because of our relationship. Mm. Um, and it's not like I couldn't see it in my other relationships or as sort of lifelong patterns, but I feel like there's a lot that you and I have expressed that we've come to understand. Uh, because of our relationships together and our mutual interests. What is the practice of relationship for both of you? What does that afford as a practice for both of you? What is that like for you? Should I go first? Yeah. I could. And I have, could. if it's possible, I don't know if it'd be possible to move a little closer, but it's I kind of hard to hear you. So. Oh, okay. Here I am. Do you want um, a cushion? No, it's all right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I um. You know, I could easily say that it's true. Like I had a, a an intellectual understanding from reading lots of tantric texts for me understand in a kind of practical um, way, in an embodied way. Uh, uh, sorry, you broke up there. You said you had an intellectual understanding from reading about it, and then you broke up. And now I have an embodied understanding, a more embodied understanding from this relationship. And one important aspect of that is definitely that uh, in an intimate relationship, sooner or later, you start encountering your own baggage mm. and becoming triggered and, and, fi and finding ways that you and your partner kind of will mutually, your, your your psychological crap will kind of dovetail and you'll get in a cycle of mutual triggering. And I've had that experience before in my life, but I've never been able to push through it before and find that, that then it's possible to not exactly heal, but in a way to heal or in a way certainly to kind of transcend some of the kind of childhood trauma that may have been warping you for your entire life. And, and, and in so doing then to reach a kind of level of trust, which allows for um, much more intense sexual connection. I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> uh, yeah, which allows- But as a facet of like all, all life in sex and then in sort of like, anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 you know, pipe in, yeah. pipe up. Yeah, because I'm, I'm at the edge of my understanding right now, but, mm -hmm. but that's part of what the practice of relationship has been for me in this relationship. Oh, that's a nice thing to say. Maybe I want to say that like, I, I, this is not, we have defined Tantra in a lot of ways, but often I mean the practice of relationship when I say it. If I'm not referring mm -hmm. more to like, like, specifically like historical things that would have been called Tantra, like in, in Southeast Asian uh, philosophy or practice. Um, I love, there's something you said, you said healing. And like, what I wanna add to that is that um, 
or I want to use a different word and say that, that it is a kind of healing that could be what one says, but like it's what is healing like I want to define it as like when we like come up against like these sort of like interlocking patterns which that's not not sexual but in this case it's like horrific and awful and terrible and painful and just the worst and um but like coming up against those sort of like patterns and the way like we kind of get stuck in them because of our intimacy like the healing is then the moments when we're able to I shouldn't undo that I was gonna have to keep my hands <laughs> now but like the then that we can um suddenly one or both of us can make a different choice so i would say that's what like healing is or like from trauma and i would say this is even what like what the sort of if you will the muscles one is flexing and practicing yoga or somatics i think is also like um having more choice like mm -hmm. opening up from like a sort of narrowness to like be able to make a fresh choice in the moment um which some people would even call that like beginner's mind or something it's a little bit like what we were reading in zen mind beginner's mind last night what so would be, you oh sorry what would you two describe is yeah i'm wondering about like it feels like the way you're describing a relationship like as these things come up that are difficult like it seems like you could get kind of subsumed by them and let them be like further triggering or further hurting or further wounding, or <laughs> they could be like opportunities to find a new way and uh, to move through it together in relationship, as you say. And like, what is what in your experience has been the thing that helps you use that as an opportunity to heal and become more connected rather than something that's like just further you know, sand in the wounds or something like that? Well, it's a years long process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not like it's gonna be one or the other. Um, sure. Right. But uh, yeah, I was gonna say persistence in a way. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. like, like it's a practice. Mm -hmm. um, it's a practice. Yeah. yeah. Even if you don't, or if I like don't wanna do it. Which is true about my yoga practice sometimes too. Yeah, sure. It's true about any practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think just like I know there is sometimes even in the worst moments, there's a little voice for me that will like pipe up and like be like, you could do this instead. And in that moment, everything in me is like, no, like I want to do like that. The getting out of like, like turning the circle into a spiral is the last fucking thing I want to do at this moment. And I'm like, but you're right, damn it. Like, that's the little thing that, so I feel like um, I think of, I would even say some of the like, <clears throat> we've done a certain amount of like intactogenic ceremony and uh, therapy together and um, that, um, has solidified me in me more that there is a certain amount of like that it's like practicing neuroplasticity to look for that little tiny like chink of light in the shadow or something maybe that's too binary but like but to look for that little place where i can like get out of the pattern to like see the pattern as part of it and then to like be like okay how can i try something new even if it's the last thing I want to do. Yeah, that's definitely my experience. And one of the things I think is that it's it's partly about kind of having that spaciousness to make different choices, which is a thing that a lot of people get from a meditation practice too. Um, but it's 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 not just about changing and sort of like as if you somehow sweep your or my, in my experience, it's not as if you somehow sweep your trauma away and it disappears. But rather, there's a kind of alchemical transformation where, in a way, uh, there's the possibility of sort of holding the wounded parts of oneself and, and allowing there to be more of a kind of general conversation or something, which hmm. um, I just, I somehow I want to get at how how relationship can be transformative and how it's tantric in the kind of the darkness, the darkness blossoms into light 
kind mm. of way. that well that is the kind of yeah the sort of like transformation or sort of like if the yin and yang are sort of like constantly turning into one another right it's not just a static picture but like the little bit of like white in the black is uh getting bigger and the little bit of black in the white is getting bigger and so that like that it's like it's dynamic and constantly um changing or interpenetrating and uh that's kind of what i mean like where there's that little voice that's like this is the choice you could make you could make a new choice right now and then that little place is the one where then it's like and suddenly it shifts and yeah right it doesn't mean unfortunately that the trauma goes away necessarily but it becomes slightly less tender or something but so like i would say that then like i maybe i use tantra interchangeably with the phrase left hand path a lot and that's what i really mean specifically in my life i mean i mean other things too i mean like the poison path or medicine path i mean a lot of things I mean, the part of me I described that was like mischievous and always wanted to pick tails. Though another, actually that's just sort of a romantic aside is that part of how you and I have connected is by be, realizing we're both people who always picked like tails in a coin flip. Mm. Uh, mm. And that that might be a certain kind of person. Um, and uh, so yeah, what was I saying? The kind of inst like instrumentalizing the shadow is some of what I would call Tantra, yeah. whether that means like in a specifically sexual context and using sort of like, like sexual space as a place to also like integrate or then like play with some of those difficult tender parts. Like to me, that's how kink is a part of it. Mm -hmm. But um, but also, I mean, in a in a wider ranging space of one's life, not just in like sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Hevajra Tantra famously has the line, we, we rise by that which makes us fall. And I think that's a good example yeah. of that. Yeah. Another thing that, that I have experienced in relationship with you that I've really come to understand about a tantric outlook on existence is the way that having clear psychological boundaries makes it more possible to experience non-separation mm -hmm. and that paradox mm -hmm. i feel like i've really really gotten to completely understand much more deeply in relationship with you and me mm -hmm. so there's a funny way in which you know like uh like like separation is like a back door into non-separation yeah and vice versa yeah so that's a little bit kind of a little bit i was saying earlier how like duality is sort of contained in non-duality or is like if we don't i do want to speak more maybe a little to what you just said about sort of interpersonal boundaries and things but i do think there's really something in like that like I mean, if we're talking about Tantra, I guess it's masculine and feminine, and I could have a whole other conversation about heteronormativity. Um, but the, any pair of like opposites, which are also pairs of complements, are a, it's, a, it's a model. So it's a binary model. And that means that the model is a placeholder for like an explosion of generative possibility. And um, um, and that's like how duality kind of, I think, can be the thing we could get trapped in it, or it can be the very thing that like, there's like, again, that little sort of like, place to sneak through into something new. Um, and yeah, maybe I just want to reiterate it. Do I have, I don't know if I have anything else to say, but there is, I too have discovered like, how the kinds of boundaries I wasn't taught sort of growing up or wasn't taught by this world through, through socialization and then how to, um, yeah, how to like form those boundaries and then like which ones are appropriate to sort of form or dissolve or like play with together and how like us each having like sort of a appropriate, which is not a word I love, but like appropriate or like well-formed personal boundaries is it lets us connect better. Yeah. And that's where it sounds like the language sound can sound dualistic, but something like me that lets me feel myself 
more clearly and fully so I can feel you or feel anyone else more clearly and fully. There's really some, something in like that paradox. What does that look like? I mean, to the extent that you feel like sharing like either of you, like what does that look like uh, specifically in, in details of like how a specific particular boundary, uh, oh, sorry, could you hear me there? Yes. Uh, yeah, like how a specific particular boundary allowed you to access both your own individuality and a kind of non-separation. Uh, the, the first example that comes to mind is too nasty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fair, yeah, sure. But, Tell me later. <laughs> but I, I mean, in a, in a simple way, I could say that sort of, you know, when we speak of boundaries, it means um, being able to kind of experience, for, for me, being able to kind of experience myself and, and know where sort of the edges of my needs are, mm. and then be able in a really simple way to say something like, I want eggs today for breakfast. Mm rather than getting caught up in a kind of mushy uh, interpersonal mess where I'm instead of instead of even knowing what I want for breakfast, I try to guess what my partner wants to hear mm -hmm. me say I want for breakfast, mm -hmm. right? Like that kind of very basic uh, interpersonal practice, <clears throat> then in the space of kind of really knowing myself and being able to express myself, I, the, the paradox is that then I also become able to empathize mm -hmm. more deeply and profoundly with my partner. Mm -hmm. And um, so to, to take the egg example, uh, <laughs> should she want tofu, which, which she definitely doesn't. Not but, for breakfast. But, <laughs> but, but let's, say she, let's say I was dating somebody who wanted scrambled tofu. You know, <laughs> <laughs> then, um, uh, there's there's a space a space opens up for actual communication, mm. which is a form of which is which is a way of approaching non separation. Is that mm. does that make yeah. some kind of sense? Yeah, it's very helpful. And yeah. you you can only really like you can you can experience that in sort of um, shallow ways outside of an intimate relationship. But but really like you kind of have to go through the you have to slog through and and have the fun of being in a kind of deep, intimate relationship to really come up against those issues, you know, over and over again to the point where, uh, oops, somebody's phone. You left your phone on. Oh, it's yeah, over sorry, there, yeah. though. No problem. Yeah. It'll stop in a minute. Just finish okay. what you're saying. <laughs> well, no, where you just, you, 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 ha you have to and get to kind of come up against those sorts of issues over and over again in a way that I think creates the you work the kind of muscle of forming those sort of boundaries which also opens up space for greater intimacy yeah. i mean i'll say there's a lot i thought i had like i mean this is just kind of the way our stuff is and the way trauma is i think in general but there was so much i thought i had looked at or worked through before this relationship and because this relationship is just the one of greatest depth i have ever had and and will ever have i feel fairly confident saying that I, um, uh, it's just astounding the depth there was to like a plum of my stuff through being in, in relationship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And so, and I'll, but I'll also say like early on, I felt this about you that, and before maybe like when the relationship was newer and before there was less of the sort of having explored the terribleness of trauma together, like I felt, and I still feel this, but just in renewed, renewed ways, how even then, like early on, again, before you were really hitting on painful stuff, I felt that you sort of like, I don't know, like energized me to be my best self or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that to me should, should be the, and result, I'm putting mm -hmm. scared quotes on all of this for those who are just listening, but somehow like to me, that should be the sort of end result of all of this as a practice. And I would say like, it's it's tantric because we're diet, like instead of 
we're like diving into the um the sort of like how day-to-day -day life with someone can be a spiritual and transformative practice yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You know, I'm really flashing on, I think this is this, the passage from Suzuki Roshi, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, you, you were referencing, but I'm really flashing on the thing where he says, when I sit Zazen, there's nobody there but me, but I'm expressing the entire universe. And when you sit Zazen, there's nobody there but you, but you're expressing the entire universe. And so we're not, we're completely together when we sit Zazen. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's something about that paradox. Yeah. Yeah. That it's similar in relationship, that like what he's talking about with Zazen is the same in, in relationship. Yeah, that by that by finding by finding yourself in a way by kind of separating yourself and finding uh you know, they, they say you you find out who you are by acting naturally. So by kind of finding your own edges in relationship you become able to express the whole by expressing yourself fully mm -hmm. and so by expressing yourself fully you're you're engaging with the whole does that make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's kind of what you said earlier about being in bed greatest being of greatest service because you're so much yourself Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. The the specific example you used of the preference for an egg is really interesting because um like th yeah, that's a that's a preference. Like I want eggs, right? But um I could imagine, I mean you were talking about boundaries and like uh for me at least if if I have a boundary or something like that, often it's like something that I don't want or it's something that I would like, like if this is gonna interface with me, like please do it this way, or, or it's like a something like that. And maybe that's just a, a negative preference, but that's been a question that's alive in my mind of like, uh, I'm thinking of Jane right now who is on the show and dear friend of mine. And like, she's taught me a lot about boundaries. She's really good at honoring her own boundaries. And then, you know, I've also done extensive practice with like what you might call like surrendering or trusting or allowing things to be and it's been an open question for me since I've learned about boundaries from Jane of like am I closing myself off to surrendering or allowing this experience if I have a boundary uh, and it seems like a, a good boundary well held like supports you in surrendering into the experience but that's that's been a recurring like puzzle or question for me of like am i closing myself off to experience or to connection or is this enabling and empowering connection and that's been yeah a, a recurring question for sure you know i you said a good boundary well held and i might say a good boundary lightly held mm -hmm. because it's it's not uh, definitely there's a danger uh, there's a danger of sort of reifying and sort of, you know, pronouncing, uh, I am the kind of person who likes eggs. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. I'm an egg like. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a. <laughs> well, that's like the. Sorry to interrupt you, but I feel like you maybe know what I'm gonna say. That's like the the virgin egg grasper versus <laughs> as an enjoyer. Yeah. <laughs> held, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. But it's more sort of being able to kind of feel into oneself, right? I mean, that's what boundaries are, is more about sort of being able to sort of really take a deep breath and sort of feel like, well, what, what, is, what, is, what is this world system? What, what is, how does this world system constructed? And kind of really feel like the, the expansiveness of this world system, which is completely unique to this one. And, and in so doing, to kind of really be fully open then to the expressiveness of, of another one yeah it doesn't mean i mean it's relationships so there's still going to be negotiation and like but but like to kind of take your example too like and this i i'm going to apply this to a sexual situation because that's where it feels but i think i'm going to describe a situation that i think is fairly common and and commonly frustrated frustrating it may not be for everyone but but i'm like the, like there's sort of uh 
like where there are sort of murky boundaries that end up like not giving anyone enough to push against to be like, well, I don't know, well, what do you want to have? Or I don't know what you want to do. And like, especially in like in like sex, that's just like such a buzzkill. Mm. I mean, not that we're not, I'm not saying I'm not against verbal communication or like saying what we want, but when it gets kind of like, oh, I don't know, like, what do you want? Like, that's <laughs> the least sexy thing. And it happens for a variety of reasons in a variety of situations. I feel like just thinking about it in the sexual realm makes it seem the most repugnant to me anyway. Mm. And being like, so I'm not going to say there's negotiation, but like, that's where like, sort of like, clearer statements about what one wants mm. and then negotiation around that is really potent and then mm. can let me I might be like oh I don't want to do that or don't feel comfortable or I might be like I don't know whatever I might be like okay I'll have a tofu scramble today fuck it like fine like fine I don't know <laughs> like it gives me a way to sort of feel my own yeah, to like feel myself in like, and negotiation is just sort of another way of relationshiping. It's just like, like. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wouldn't even say, I mean, yeah, there's negotiation, but there's also, you may have talked about this already. There's also the thing that we've talked about, about like a probability way of collapse. I right? actually didn't talk you about didn't this. Talk about it's, something, it's something I've been writing about that trying to, I've been writing an article for a Thing I write for about like Tantra mm. as, as sort of a quantum wave collapse. So go on. <laughs> but I mean, in a way, that's kind of what it is. Like, like uh, if, if you have a clear expression of, let's say you have a clear, let's just call it a desire, um, a clear expression of a desire. I'm going to do this now. And, and when one, we've got, let's say you have just two parties to keep it simple. You, when one party does it, then the uh, that collapse in a way kind of collapses the other party out of a probability matrix mm. into a state into statefulness and then the mm. dance begins mm -hmm. right yeah. and and the other thing can happen too where like a, a strong uh, sort of a strong statefulness on one party can can pop the other party out of statefulness into a probability field right yeah 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 <laughs> wow that's really cool uh, yeah. Mm. I think, but i also yeah, it doesn't sound paradoxical given what we've just talked about but i also feel like yeah i either turn into the other um because too much probability field can be really murky but too much statefulness can be too rigid yeah, yeah. right right mm. Well, speaking of boundaries, I know uh, you had mentioned needing to go at around this time. Um, I'm, I'm free to keep talking, but if there's anything else either of you would like to say or close out, just want to make it possible for you to leave if you need to leave. Yeah. Is there anything else we want to talk about? Uh, no. And so, no, I, I, shall I leave and let you, I'll let you two finish up. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Oh, it was lovely to see you, Hap. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, Tosh. <laughs> Take care. Is there anything else that you wanted to share, Booty? Gosh, I feel like later today or mm -hmm. like next week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Great. We're right now. Sure. I think You're we, good. Yeah, we covered so much. Thank, we yeah, did. Thank well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on and uh, also for bringing Hap in. And it was really lovely to speak with you today. Yeah, thank you. So lovely to speak with you. Such an honor to be here. Mm.